92nd Street Y online media is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. This program, part of the Unterberg Poetry Center's 75 at 75 project, features Leonard Cohen reading from his work. It was recorded live on February 14, 1966, before a live audience at New York's 92nd Street Y. Can I do this without explanations? Occasionally, I will have the occasion to invoke the name of Catherine Tikakwita, whose statue in bronze you can find on the front door, if I may use so prosaic a description of such a magnificent aperture of St. Patrick's Cathedral. She was a Mohawk Indian who died in 1680, converted by the Jesuits to Catholicism, and uh, distinguished herself by uh, an enthusiastic and severe adherence to the more penitential side of the Catholic faith. She was the first Mohawk, which was an extremely promiscuous and enthusiastic tribe of dancers. She was the first Mohawk to take an oath of virginity. In the passages I read, there may be no reference to her at all. <laughs> Although her presence, her presence does somehow inform all my work. And somehow, sometime, when I'm ready, uh, I will place a bouquet of roses beneath those bronze doors. And when I am especially pure, I will be able to lay at her feet a pair of small white transistor radios. These passages, which I'm about to read, take place in the System Theater on St. Catherine Street in Montreal, which some of you may know. It is threatened by a housing, by a, an office development, and um, I am the chairman of a committee, <laughs> which is called SOS, Save Our System. There, done. Dear friend, I did what was necessary. I did what I dreamed about when you, Edith, and I sat on the austere seats of the system theater. Do you know the question with which I tormented myself during those silvery hours? At last I can tell you, we are now in the heart of the system theater. We are in the dark, jockeying for elbow dominion on the wooden armrests. Outside on St. Catherine Street, the theater marquee displays the only neon failure in miles of light, dropping two letters which will never be repaired. It signals itself as STEM theater, STEM theater, STEM theater. Secret Cabals of vegetarians habitually gather under the sign to exchange contraband from beyond the vegetable barrier. In their pinpoint eyes dances their old dream, the total fast. One of them reports a new atrocity published without compassionate comment by the editors of Scientific American. It has been established that, when pulled from the ground, a radish produces an electronic scream. <laughs> Not even the triple bill for 65 cents will comfort them tonight. 
With a mad laugh born of despair, one of them throws himself on a hot dog stand, disintegrating on the first chew into pathetic withdrawal symptoms. The rest watch him mournfully and then separate into the Montreal entertainment section. The news is more serious than any of them thought. One is ravished by a steakhouse with sidewalk ventilation. In a restaurant, one argues with the waiter that he ordered tomato, but then, in a suicide of gallantry, he agrees to accept the spaghetti meat sauce mistake. But this is far away from the glass pillar of stubs, which the three of us passed and satisfied hours ago. Let us not forget that these doorway ticket depositories are not altogether docile. On more than several occasions, I have stood behind a customer whose stub the, the chute rejects absolutely, and he is forced to get his money back from the contemptuous female sentry booth. They are not pleasant to deal with, these women posted in the entrances of every cinema. They are bound by choice to guard St. Catherine Street against self-destruction. The little street-side offices which they dominate protect the army of traffic by an administration which combines the best functions of Red Cross and general headquarters. And what of the unacceptable patron with his money back? Where can he go? Was the cruel rejection arbitrary in the sense that society invents crime so as to make itself indispensable? There is no dark for him to eat the O. Henry. All candy is threatened. <laughs> Mere suicide vaudeville for the living? Or is there some ointment on the refusal of the toothed throat of the stub depository? Is this the kingly oil of election? Does some new hero discover his ordeal? Is this, birth, is this the birth of the hermit, or his equally passionate compliment, the anti-hermit, seed of the Jesuit? And this chess-side choice between saint and missionary, is this his first tragic testing? No matter to Edith, you and I, who have safely passed two aisles and half an alphabet, well into the bright amusement. We are now in the heart of the last feature in the system theater. Within severe limits, like smoke in a chimney, the dusty projection beam above our hair twisted and changed. Like crystals rioting in a test tube suspension, the unstable ray changed and changed in its black confinement. Like battalions of sabotage parachutists falling from the training tower straight down in various contortions, the frames streamed at the screen, splashing into contrast color as they hit, just as the bursting cocoons of Arctic camouflage spread colorful organic contents over the snow as the divers disintegrate one after the other. No, it was more like a ghostly white snake sealed in an immense telescope. It was a serpent swimming home, lazily occupying the entire sewer which irrigated the auditorium. It was the first snake in the shadows of the original garden, the albino orchard snake, offering our female memory the taste of everything. As it floated and danced and writhed in the gloom over us, I often raised my eyes to consult the projection beam rather than the story it carried. Neither of you noticed me. Sometimes I conceded surprising territories of the armrest so as to distract your pleasure. I studied the snake and he made me greedy for everything. In the midst of this heady contemplation, I am invited to formulate the question which will torment me most. I formulate the question, and it begins to torment me immediately. <laughs> what will happen when the newsreel escapes into the feature? 
What will happen when the newsreel occurs at its own pleasure or accident in any whatever frame of the Vista Vision willy-nilly? The newsreel lies between the street and the feature like Boulder Dam, vital as a border in the Middle East. Breach it, so I thought, and a miasmal mixture will imperialize existence by means of its sole quality of total erosion, so I thought. The newsreel lies between the street and the feature. Like a tunnel on the Sunday drive, it ends quickly and in creepy darkness joins the rural mountains to the slums. It took courage. I let the newsreel escape. I invited it to walk right into the plot, and they merged in awful originality. Just as trees and plastic synthesize new powerful landscapes in those districts of the highway devoted to motels. Long live motels, the name, the motive, the success. Here is my message, old lover of my heart. Here is what I saw, here is what I learned. Sophia Lauren strips for a flood victim. <laughs> the flood is real at last. I do not know what bravado compelled me to come up here without my transistor radio. Three months without my radio, humming the obsolete top 10. <laughs> my top 10 removed so abruptly from history, cut off from the dynamic changes of jukebox stock market, my poor top 10 that no 13-year-olds energize by slippery necking on the carpet beside the hi-fi. My over-serious top 10 goose-stepping through my head like the generals of a junta who do not know the coup d'etat has been staged the very night of the formal ball. <laughs> my dear old top 10 like a battalion of gold-sleeved tramway conductors patiently steering for seniority and retirement while the subway has been decreed in a boardroom and all the streetcars are in museums. My awkward top 10 of electric echoes and longing puberty voices crying down my heart like a squad of bare-thighed cheerleaderettes turning cartwheels before the empty benches their delicate bra straps bunching the skin ever so sweetly, their shiny fluorescent underwear flashing out of little upside-down pleated skirts as they pivot on their friendship fingers, their school spirit, satin-clad, gym-trained, firm little rah-rah bums describing unutterably lovely and brief rainbow-shaped streaks of mauve and orange, the round metal mouthpieces of their megaphones warm with alma maters and smelling of white lipstick, and for whom these moist technicolor acrobatics, for whom these inflammatory arcs of unskirted exhibition panties gleaming through the cheers like so many expertly peeled fresh figs, yes, a million seedy secrets in each sealed purse wheeling down the damp sidelines into the stumpy mouth of time. For whom do you sail, little bums of the top 10? <laughs> the leader of the pack lies mangled under his Honda <laughs> in a wreck of job prospects. The ghostly Negro fullback floats down the wintry gridiron into law school prizes. And the lucky football you autograph takes pictures of the moon. Oh, my poor top 10, longing to perish in popularity. I have forgotten my radio, so you languish with the other zombies of my memory, 
you whose only honor is harakiri with the blunt edge of returned identification bracelets. <laughs> My weary top ten, hoping to be forgotten, like escape balloons and kites, like theater stubs, like dry ball pens, like old batteries, like coiled sardine keys, like bent aluminum partitioned eaten TV dinner plates. I hoard you like the stuff of my chronic disease. I sentence you to national anthem hard labor. I deny you martyrdom in tomorrow's hit parade. I turn you into boomerangs, my little kamikazes. You long to be the lost tribes, but I burn arm numbers. I pour mil miracle drugs in the death house. From bridges, I hang suicide notes. Saints and friends, help me out of history. Make the birds sing slower. Make me listen faster. Remove yourself from this treehouse pain, you tree-climbing frog, large as industry. The next scene takes place in, a, uh, in the occup occupational therapy room in a mental institution in Montreal. It may be recreational therapy, for all we know. A man is writing a letter a man who professed in his life to be the guru of the man to whom he is sending this letter. He is writing the letter while a nurse with whom he has become enamored responds to his promiscuous and amorous advances. You plague me like the moon. I knew you were bound by old laws of suffering and obscurity. I am fearful of the cripple's wisdom. A pair of crutches, a grotesque limp, can ruin a stroll which I begin in a new suit, clean-shaven, whistling. I envied you the certainty that you would amount to nothing. I coveted the magic of torn clothes. I was jealous of the terrors I constructed for you, but could not tremble before myself. I was never drunk enough, never poor enough, never rich enough. All this hurts, perhaps it hurts enough. It makes me want to cry out for comfort. It makes me stretch my hands out horizontally. Yes, I long to be president of the new republic. I love to hear the armed teenagers chant my name outside the hospital gates. Long live the revolution. Let me be president for my last 30 days. Where are you walking tonight, dear friend? Did you give up meat? Are you disarmed and empty, an instrument of grace? Can you stop talking? Has loneliness led you into ecstasy? I dare to hope that you will produce the pearl and justify these poor secreted irritations. This letter is written in the old language, and it has caused me no little discomfort to recall the obsolete usages. I've had to stretch my mind back into areas bordered with barbed wire from which I spent a lifetime removing myself. However, I do not regret the effort. Our love will never die, that I can promise you, I who launched this letter like a kite among the winds of your desire. We were born together, and in our kisses we confessed our longing to be born again. We lay in each other's arms, each of us the other's teacher. We sought the peculiar tone of each peculiar night. We tried to clear away the static, suffering under the hint that the static was part of the tone. I was your adventure, and you were my adventure. I was your journey, and you were my journey and Edith was our holy star. This letter rises out of our love like the sparks between dueling swords, like the shower of needles from flapping cymbals, like the bright seeds of sweat sliding through the center of our tight embrace, 
like the white feathers hung in the air by razored Bushido cocks, like the shriek between two approaching puddles of mercury, like the atmosphere of secrets which twin children exude. I was your mystery and you were my mystery, and we rejoiced to learn that mystery was our home. Our love cannot die. Out of history I come to tell you this. Like two mammoths, tusk locked in earnest sport, at the edge of the advancing age of ice, we preserve each other. Our queer love keeps the line of our manhood hard and clean so that we bring nobody but our own self to our separate marriage beds and our women finally know us. Mary Vuland, that's the name of the nurse, has finally admitted my left hand into the creases of her uniform. She watched me compose the above paragraph, so I let it run on rather excessively. Women love excess in a man because it separates him from his fellows and makes him lonely. All that women know of the male world has been revealed to them by lonely, excessive refugees from it. Raging fairies they cannot resist because of their highly specialized intelligence. Keep writing, she hisses. <laughs> Mary has turned her back to me. Her balloons are shrieking like whistles, signaling the end of every labor. Mary pretends to inspect a large rug some patient wove, thus shielding our precious play. Slow as a snail, I push my hand palm down up the tight, rough stocking on the back of her thigh. The linen of her skirt is crisp and cool against my knuckles and nails. The stocking thigh is warm, curved, a little damp, like a loaf of fresh white bread. Higher, she hisses. I am in no hurry. <laughs> Old friend, I am in no hurry. I feel I shall be doing this throughout eternity. Her buttocks contract impatiently, like two boxing gloves touching before the match. My hand pauses to ride the quiver on the thigh. Hurry, she hisses. Yes, I can tell by the tension in the stocking that I am approaching the peninsula which is hitched to the garter device. I will travel the whole peninsula, hot skin on either side, then I will leap off the nipple-shaped garter device. The threads of the stocking tighten. I bunch my fingers together so as not to make premature contact. Mary is jiggling, endangering the journey. My forefinger scouts out the garter device. It is warm. The little metal loop, the rubber button, warm right through. Please, she hisses. Like angels on the head of a pin, my fingers dance on the rubber button. Which way shall I leap? Toward the outside thigh, hard, warm as the shell of a beached tropical turtle? Or toward the swampy mess in the middle? Or fasten like a bat? on the huge, soft, overhanging boulder of her right buttock. It is very humid up her white starch skirt. It is like one of those airplane hangers wherein clouds form and it actually rains indoors. <laughs> Mary is bouncing her bum like a piggy bank which is withholding a gold coin. The inundations are about to begin. I choose the middle, yes. Delicious soup stews my hand. Vicious geysers shower my wrist. Magnetic rain tests my bulova. She jiggles for position, then drops over my fist like a gorilla net. I had been snaking through her wet hair, compressing it between my fingers like cotton candy. 
Now I am surrounded by artesian exuberance, nippy frills, numberless bulby brains, pumping constellations of mucous hearts. Moist Morse messages move up my arm, master my intellectual head, more and more massage dormant portions of dark brain, elect happy new kings for the exhausted pretenders of the mind. I am a seal inventing undulations in a vast electric aquacade. I am wires of tungsten burning in the seas of bulb. I am creature of Mary Cave. I am froth of Mary Wave. Bums of Nurse Mary applaud greedily as she maneuvers to plow herself on the edge of my arm bone, rows of rectum sliding up and down like the dream of banister fiend. Slish, slosh, slish, slosh. Are we not happy? Loud as we are, no one hears us. But this is a tiny miracle in the midst of all this bounty. So are the rainbow crowns hovering over every skull, but tiny miracles. Mary looks at me over her shoulder, greeting me with rolled up eyes, white as eggshells, and an open goldfish mouth, a maze smile. In the gold sunshine of occupational therapy, everyone believes he is a stinking genius, offering baskets, ceramic ashtrays, thongs sewn wallets on the radiant altars of their perfect health. Old friend, you may kneel as you read this, for now I come to the sweet burden of my argument. I did not know what I had to tell you, but now I know. I did not know what I wanted to proclaim, but now I am sure. I did not know what I wanted to proclaim. All my speeches were preface to this, all my exercises but a clearing of my throat. I confess I tortured you only to draw your attention to this. I confess I betrayed you only to tap your shoulder. In our kisses, this ancient darling I meant to whisper. God is alive. Magic is afoot. God is alive. Magic is afoot. God is afoot. Magic is alive. Alive is afoot. Magic never died. God never sickened. Many poor men lied. Many sick men lied. Magic never weakened. Magic never hid. Magic always ruled. God is afoot. God never died. God was ruler, though his funeral lengthened. Though his mourners thickened, magic never fled. Though his shrouds were hoisted, the naked God did live. Though his words were twisted, the naked magic thrived. Though his death was published round and round the world, the heart did not believe. Many hurt men wondered, many struck men bled. Magic never faltered, magic always led. Many stones were rolled, but God would not lie down. Many wild men lied, many fat men listened. Though they offered stones, magic still was fed. Though they locked their coffers, God was always served. Magic is afoot, God rules, alive is afoot, alive is in command. Many weak men hungered, many strong men thrived. Though they boasted solitude, God was at their side, nor the dreamer in his cell, nor the captain on the hill. Magic is alive, though his death was pardoned round and round the world, the heart would not believe. Though laws were carved in marble, they could not shelter men. Though altars built in parliaments, they could not order men. Police arrested magic, and magic went with them, for magic loves the hungry. But magic would not tarry. It moves from arm to arm. It would not stay with them. Magic is afoot. It cannot come to harm. It rests in an empty palm. It spawns in an empty mind. But magic is no instrument. Magic is the end. Many men drove magic, but magic stayed behind. Many strong men lied. They only passed through magic and out the other side. Many weak men lied. They came to God in secret, and though they left him nourished, they would not tell who healed. Though mountains danced before them, they said that God was dead. Though his shrouds were hoisted, the naked God did live. 
this I mean to whisper to my mind, this I mean to laugh with in my mind, this I mean my mind to serve till service is but magic moving through the world, and mind itself is magic coursing through the flesh, and flesh itself is magic dancing on a clock, and time itself the magic length of God. Old friend, aren't you happy? You and Edith alone know how long I've waited for this instruction. Damn you, Mary Voolen spits at me. What? Your hand's gone limp. Can I read some more from this book? This is a section in which Edith, who is someone you need not know about, is being pursued through the woods outside of Trois-Rivières. She is a, an Indian girl of, a, of 16 or 14 or 12. 13, actually. Now it is time for Edith to run, run between the old Canadian trees. But where are the doves today? Where is the smiling, luminous fish? Where are the hiding places hiding? Where is grace today? Why isn't candy being fed to history? Where is the Latin music? Help! Edith ran through the woods, 13 years old, the men after her. She was wearing a dress made from flour sacks. A certain flower company packed their products in sacks printed with flowers. <laughs> there is a 13-year-old girl running through needle pine. Have you ever seen such a thing? Follow her, eternal cock of the brain. Edith told me this story, or part of it, years later. And I've been pursuing her little body through the forest ever since, I confess. Here I am, an old scholar, wild with unspecific grief, compulsive detective of gonad shadows. Edith, forgive me. It was always the 13-year-old victim I always took. Forgive yourself, F said. 13-year-old skin is very beautiful. What other food besides brandy is good after 13 years in the world? The Chinese eat old eggs, but that is no comfort. Oh, Catherine Tikakwita, send me 13-year-olds today. I am not cured. I will never be cured. I do not want to write this history. I do not want to mate with thee. I do not want to be as facile as F. I do not want to be the leading Canadian authority. I do not want a new yellow table. I do not want astral knowledge. I do not want to do the telephone dance. I do not want to conquer the plague. I want 13-year-olds in my life. <laughs> Bible King David had one to warm his dying bed. Why shouldn't we associate with beautiful people? Tight, tight, tight. Oh, I want to be trapped in a 13-year-old life. I know all about war and business. I am aware of shit. 13-year-old electricity is very sweet to suck, and I am or let me be tender as a hummingbird. Don't I have some hummingbird in my soul? Isn't there something timeless and unutterably light in my lust, hovering over a young wet crack in a blur of blonde hair? Oh, come, hardy darlings. There is nothing of King Midas in my touch. I freeze nothing into money. I merely graze your hopeless nipples as they grow from me into architectural problems. I change nothing as I float and sip under the first bra. Help! Four men followed Edith. Damn every one of them. I can't blame them. The village was behind them, filled with families and business. These men had watched her for years. French-Canadian school books do not encourage respect for the Indians. Some part of the Canadian Catholic mind is not certain of the church's victory over the medicine man. No wonder the forests of Quebec are mutilated and sold to America. Magic trees sawed with a crucifix. Murder the saplings. Bittersweet is the sap of a 13-year-old. 
O tongue of the nation, why don't you speak for yourself? Can't you see what is behind all this teenage advertising? Is it only money? What does wooing the teenage market really mean? Look at all the 13-year-old legs on the floor spread in front of the TV screen. Is it only to sell them cereals and cosmetics? Madison Avenue is thronged with hummingbirds who want to drink from those little barely-haired crevices. Woo them, woo them suited writers of commercial poems. Dying America wants a 13-year-old Abishag to warm its bed. Men who shave want little girls to ravish, but sell them high heels instead. The sexual hit parade is written by fathers who shave, oh, suffering, child-lust offices of the business world. And there is a 13-year-old blonde lying on the back seat of a parked car, one nylon toe playing with the armrest ashtray, the other foot on the rich interior carpet, dimples on her cheeks and only a hint of innocent acne and her garter belt is correctly uncomfortable. Far away roam the moon and a few police flashlights. Her Beethoven panties are damp from the prom. She alone of all the world believes that fucking is holy, dirty, and beautiful. And who is this making his way through the bushes? It is her chemistry teacher. who smiled all night while she danced with the football star because it is the foam rubber of his car she lies dreaming on. Charity begins alone, F used to say. Many long nights have taught me that the chemistry teacher is not merely a sneak. He loves youth truly. Advertising courts lovely things. Nobody wants to make life hell. In the hardest cell, exists a thirsty, love-torn hummingbird. F wouldn't want me to hate forever the men who pursued Edith. Sob, sob, whimper, oh, oh. They caught up with her in a stone quarry of an abandoned mine, someplace very mineral and hard, owned indirectly by U.S. interests. Edith was a beautiful 13-year-old Indian orphan living with foster Indian parents because her father and mother had been killed in an avalanche. She had been abused by schoolmates who didn't think she was Christian. Even at 13, she had lovely, freakishly long nipples, she told me. Perhaps this news had leaked out of the school shower room. Perhaps that was the underground rumor which had inflamed the root of the whole town. Perhaps the business and religion of the town kept operating as usual, but every single person is secretly obsessed with this nipple information. The mass is undermined with nipple dream. The picket line of strikers at the local asbestos factory is not wholly devoted to labor. There is something absent in the blows and tear gas of the provincial police, for all minds are pursing for extraordinary nipple. Daily life cannot tolerate this fantastic intrusion. Edith's nipples are an absolute pearl, irritating the workable, monotonous protoplasm of village existence. Who can trace the subtle mechanics of the collective will to which we all contribute? I believe that in some way, the village delegated these four men to pursue Edith into the forest. Get Edith, commanded the collective will. Get her magic nipples off our mind. Help me, Mother Mary. They ran her to the ground. They ripped off the dress with the company's raspberry pattern. It was a summer afternoon. Black flies ate her. The men were drunk on beer. They laughed and called her sauvagesse. Ha, ha. They pulled off her underwear, rolling it down her long brown legs. And when they tossed it aside, they did not notice that it looked like a big pink pretzel. They were surprised that her underwear was so clean. A heathen's underwear should be limp and smeared. They were not frightened by the police. Somehow they knew the police wished them well. One of their brothers-in-law was a policeman. They dragged her into the shadows because each man wanted to be somewhat alone. Dare I go on? They turned her over to see if the dragging had scraped her. 
Black flies ate her buttocks, which were dazzlingly round. They twisted her over again and pulled her deeper into the shadows, because now they were ready to remove her underwear top. The shadows were so thick and deep at the corner of the quarry that they could hardly see, and this is what they wanted. Edith peed in fear, and they heard the noise of it louder than their laughter and hard reading. It was a steady sound, and it seemed to go on forever, steady and forceful, louder than their thoughts, louder than the crickets who were grinding out an elegy for the end of the afternoon. The fall of yellow on last year's leaves and pine needles developed to a monolithic tumult in eight years. It was the pure sound of impregnable nature, and it ate like acid at their plot. It was a sound so majestic and simple, a holy symbol of frailty which nothing could violate. They froze, each one of them suddenly lonely, their erections collapsing like closed accordions, but the men refused to cooperate with the miracle, as F called it. They could not bear to learn that Edith was no longer other, that she was indeed sister. Natural law they felt, but collective law they obeyed. Lovers of my beloved, watch how my words put on her lips like clothes, how they wear her body like a rare shawl. Fruit is pyramided on the windowsill, songs flutter against the disappearing wall. The sky of the city is washed in the fire of Lebanese cedar and gold. In smoky filigree cages, the apes and peacocks fret. Now the cages do not hold. In the burning street, man and animal perish in each other's arms. Peacocks drown around the melting throne. Is it the king who lies beside you listening? Is it Solomon or David or stuttering Charlemagne? Is that his crown in the suitcase beside your bed? When we meet again, you all in white, I smelling of orchards, when we meet, but now you awaken and you are tired of this dream. Turn toward the sad-eyed man. He stayed by you all the night. You will have something to say to him. I once believed a single line in a Chinese poem could change forever how blossoms fell, and that the moon itself climbed on the grief of concise weeping men to journey over cups of wine. I thought invasions were begun for crows to pick at a skeleton, dynasties sown and spent to serve the language of a fine lament. I thought governors ended their lives as sweetly drunken monks, telling time by rain and candles, instructed by an insect's pilgrimage across the page. All this so one might send an exile's perfect letter to an ancient hometown friend. I chose a lonely country, broke from love, scorned the fraternity of war. I polished my tongue against the pumice moon, floated my soul in cherry wine, a perfume barge for lords of memory to languish on, to drink, to whisper out their store of strength, as if Beyond the mist along the shore, their girls, their power, still obeyed, like clocks wound for a thousand years. I waited until my tongue was sore. Brown petals wind like fire around my poems. I aimed them at the stars, but like rainbows they were bent before they sawed the world in half. Who can trace the canyon paths cattle have carved out of time, wandering from meadowlands to feasts. Layer after layer of autumn leaves are swept away. Something forgets us perfectly. You have the lovers. They are nameless, their histories only for each other. And you have the room, the bed, and the windows. Pretend it is a ritual. Unfurl the bed, bury the lovers, blacken the windows. 
Let them live in that house for a generation or two. No one dares disturb them. Visitors in the corridor tiptoe past the long closed door. They listen for sounds, for a moan, for a song. Nothing is heard, not even breathing. You know they are not dead. You can feel the presence of their intense love. Your children grow up, they leave you. They have become soldiers and riders. Your mate dies after a life of service. Who knows you? Who remembers you? But in your house a ritual is in progress. It is not finished, it needs more people. One day the door is opened to the lover's chamber. The room has become a dense garden full of colors, smells, sounds you have never known. The bed is smooth as a wafer of sunlight in the midst of the garden that stands alone. In the bed, the lovers slowly and deliberately and silently perform the act of love. Their eyes are closed as tightly as if heavy coins of flesh lay on them. Their lips are bruised with new and old bruises. Her hair and his beard are hopelessly tangled. When he puts his mouth against her shoulder, she is uncertain whether her shoulder has given or received the kiss. All her flesh is like a mouth. He carries his fingers along her waist and feels his own waist caressed. She holds him closer and his own arms tighten around her. She kisses the hand beside her mouth. It is his hand or her hand. It hardly matters. There are so many more kisses. You stand beside the bed, weeping with happiness. You carefully peel away the sheets from the slow-moving bodies. Your eyes are filled with tears. You barely make out the lovers. As you undress, you sing out, and your voice is magnificent because now you believe it is the first human voice heard in that room. The garments you let fall grow into vines. You climb into bed and recover the flesh. You close your eyes and allow them to be sewn shut. You create an embrace and fall into it. There is only one moment of pain or doubt as you wonder how many multitudes are lying beside your body. But a mouth kisses and a hand soothes the moment away. One last song. It's true that all the men you knew were dealers who said they were through with dealing every time you gave them shelter. I know that kind of man. It's hard to hold the hand of anyone who's reaching for the sky just to surrender. And leaning on the windowsill, he'll say that you have caused his will to weaken with your love and warmth and shelter. And taking from his wallet an old schedule of trains, he'll say, I told you when I came, I was a stranger. I told you when I came, I was a stranger. And sweeping up the jokers that he left behind, you find he didn't leave you very much, not even laughter. Like any dealer, he was watching for the car that is so high and wild, he'll never need to deal another. He was just some Joseph looking for a man. But now another stranger seems to want you to ignore his dreams as though they were the burden of another. You've seen that man before, his golden arm dispatching cards, but now it's rusted from the elbow to the finger. And he wants to trade the game he knows for shelter. 
But you cannot watch another tired man lay down his hand like he was giving up the holy game of poker. And while he talks his dreams to sleep, you notice there's a highway that is curling up like smoke above his shoulder. You flick it off, it holds you like a mirror. You tell him to come in, sit down, but something makes you turn around. The door is open, you can't close your shelter. You try the handle of the road, it opens. Do not be afraid, it's you, my love, it's you. I was sure we'd meet between the trains we're waiting for. I think it's time to board another. Please understand, I never had a secret charm to get me to the heart of this or any other matter. Yes, he talks like this. You don't know what to answer. Let's meet tomorrow. If you choose upon the shore beneath the bridge that they are building on some endless river, then he leaves the platform for the sleeping car that's warm. You realize he's only advertising one more shelter. And it comes to you, he never was a stranger. And you say, okay, the bridge or some place later. Sweeping up the jokers that he left behind You find he didn't leave you very much Not even laughter Like any dealer He was watching for the car That is so high and wild He'll never need to deal another He was just some Joseph looking for a manger And leaning on the windowsill He'll say that have caused his will to weaken with your love and warmth and shelter and taking from his wallet an old schedule of trains he'll say I told you when I came I was a stranger I told you when I came I was a stranger Thanks for listening. 92nd Street Y, Unterberg Poetry Center webcasts, and access to our archive are made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. For more information on 92nd Street Y and all our programs, please visit us on the web at 92y.org. This program is copyright 1966 by 92nd Street Y.